We have said that open source development is an approach to software development in which the source code of our software system is published and the volunteers are invited to participate in the development process. So you see with open source development, um, the source code is, is, it is like shared by everyone. And we have many volunteers who can change the process, who can improve the process. We have the history of open source development. It, um, yeah, it is rooted in the Free Software Foundation and it advocates that source code should, um, should not be proprietary, but rather should always be available for users to examine and modify as they wish. We have extended this idea by using the internet to recruit a much larger population of volunteer de developers. Many of them are also users of the code. That's why we say that we have many volunteer developers who can change and uh, improve the quality of the code with open source systems. Um, yeah, as you know, one of the best known per open source product is the Linux operating system and we use it widely as a server system. You have this class in this course this semester I know. Um, yeah and some of the some of the developers use it as a desk environment too. We have other important open source products like Java, MySQL, database management system, etc. And when we, yeah, for a company involved in software development, there are two open source issues that have to be considered. The first one is, should a product that is being developed use, um, make use of open source components? The second issue to be considered is that, should an open source approach be used for the software's development? And we have noticed that more and more product companies are using an open source approach to development and their business model is not reliant on selling the our software product but on selling support for that product and that they believe involving the the open source community will allow software to be developed more cheaply more quickly and will create a community of users for the software. That's the benefits or the advantage of using open source systems. We have talked about open source licensing. We say that although a fundamental principle of open source development is that source code should be freely available this does not mean that anyone can do as they wish with that code. We have still several constraints. Legally, the developer of the code, either a company or an individual, still owns the code. They can place restrictions on how it is used by including legally binding conditions in an open source software license. And some open source developers believe that if an open source com component is used to develop a new system, then that system should also be open source. Others are willing to allow their code to be used without this restriction. The developed systems may be proprietary and sold as closed source, co source systems. Mm, in general, most open source licenses are derived from one of three general models. We will see these three general models in detail. The first one is the GNU, is the gen general public license. We call it also reciprocal license. And it means that if we use open source software that is licensed under the general public license, then we must make that software open source 
that means once we have used the open source software with this license then what we have worked later which is based on this license we need to make it public too the second model is the gnu laser general public license it is a variant of the gpl that means the first one general public license where we can write components that link to open source code without having to publish the source of these components. However, if we change the license to par component, then we must publish this at open source too. You see there is a slight difference between G, LGPL and GPL, it is less lesser general public license. We can write components that, that link to open source code without having to publish the source of these components. And the third model is the Berkeley Standard Distribution License. This is a non-reciprocal license. It means that we are not obliged to republish any changes or modifications made to open source code. We can include the code in proprietary systems that are sold. So you see, if we use open source components, we must acknowledge the original creator of the code if we use this BSD license. Now we will see the license management. We have, yeah. In fact, normally the companies managing projects that use open source should respect several things. The first one is to establish a system for maintaining information about open source components that are downloaded and used. We have, to, we have to keep a copy of the license for each component that, uh, that was valid at the time the component was used. Licenses may change, so we need to know the conditions that we have, to, we have agreed to. Yeah, as what we have seen before, we have four, no, we have three, general models, we need to know for the conditions of each model, then we can choose the corresponding model for our system. The second one is to be aware or to be aware of the different types of licenses and understand how component is licensed before it is used. You see here, we, we need to decide to use a component in our system, but not in another, because we plan to use these systems in different ways. And the third one is to be aware of evolution pathways for components. We need to know a bit about the, the open source project where components are developed to understand how they might change in future. Also, we need to educate people about open source. It's not enough to have procedures in place to ensure compliance with license conditions. We also need to educate developers about open source and open source licensing. Yeah, we should have auditing systems in place. That means developers under tight deadlines might be tempted to break the terms of a license. If possible, 
we should have software in place to detect and stop this. The last one is to participate in the in the open source community. If we rely on open source products, we should participate in the community and help support their development. So you see the business model of software is changing. It is becoming increasingly difficult to build a business by selling specialized software systems. And many companies prefer to make their software open source and then sell support and consultancy to software users. As we have noticed, this phenomenon is likely to be a trend. That means there are more and more situations like this with increasing use of open source software and with more and more software available in this form. This is the, all the contents for this seventh chapter. We'll see the key points in this chapter. In this chapter, we have seen that software design and implementation are interleaved activities. The level of detail in the design depends on the type of system and whether you are using a plan-driven or agile approach. Yeah, we see that the agile approach need less documentations than plan-driven approach. So when we when we are with the software design implementation activity, we need to be sure with the level of detail in the design. The process of object-oriented design includes activities to design the system architecture, define objects in the system, describe the design using different object models and document the component interfaces. Yeah, you see these one, two, three, four, these four activities. I think we have also talked about them before. We design the system architecture, we identify objects in the system, we describe the design using different object models and document the component interfaces. A range of different models may be produced to use them during an object-oriented design process. Yeah. We have talked about static models and the dynamic models. Static, static models include class models, generalization models, and association models. For the dynamic models, we include the sequence models, state machine models. Yeah, we have seen all these kinds of models before with the, the examples. And pay attention, component inf interfaces must be defined precisely so that other objects can use them. And a UML interface stereotype may be used to define interfaces. When we develop software, we should always consider the possibility of reusing existing software, either as components, services, or complete systems. Yeah, we see. We say that 
The reuse of software are important. Yeah, the reuse is important. And also we have different levels of reusing existing software. Here we have mentioned the components, services or complete systems. Mm. Yeah, we have also talked about the configuration management, which is the process of managing changes to an evolving software system. It is essential when a team of people are cooperating to de develop software. <clears throat> yeah. However, most software development is a horse target development. That means, um, yeah, we use an integrated development environment on a host machine to develop the software. And then we transfer the software to our target machine to for execution. So we see a host machine and a target machine. They are different machines. We need to sometimes we need to to solve the the interface problems between them. The last part of this chapter, we have talked about the open source development. It involves making the source code of a system publicly available. It means that many people can propose changes and improvements to the software. Yeah, that's the definition of the open source or yeah, the meaning of the open source development system. Okay, these are the seventh chapter. Now we are continue with our eighth chapter. In the eighth chapter, we talk about the software testing. And the objective of this chapter is to introduce software testing and software testing processes. Normally, after reading this chapter, we will understand the stage of testing from testing during development to acceptance testing by system customers. We will be introduced to techniques that help us choose test cases that are geared to discovering program defects. Normally, we will understand the test first development where we design tests before writing code and run these tests automatically. Oh yeah, we have mentioned the test first development before too. We should also know the important differences between component system and release testing and be aware of user testing processes and techniques. In detail, in this chapter, we will cover these topics. The first one is the development testing. The second one is test driven development. The third one is release testing. And the fourth one is the user testing. Now, we'll see these topics in detail. For the program testing, testing, yeah, the objective, yeah, we have several objectives of program testing. Mm. Yeah, so according to your understanding, Normally, why we need to test the model? What do we test with the system? What do we test? Bugs, yeah. Glitches.
redundant codes. Mm, yeah. Ooh. So for you, mm, what you have mentioned till now are some something about the code. Yeah. That means if we have some some problems with the code, um, we need to debug it. We need to duplicate code. Yeah, we need to eliminate some, we can say useless code. We need to solve with the glitches. So the most, most of the problem you have mentioned are with the code. Yeah, okay. Mm, but we have some other important things than code. Do you have some ideas? User experience, user features. Yeah, it's something like this. It's the requirements, user requirements. Mm. We need to guarantee that what we have developed corresponds to what the customer needs, what they want. Perhaps our program works very well. We have perfect code. It, uh, it runs efficiency, efficiently. However, if the functionality don't, yeah, doesn't correspond to what the client wants, then we may have some problems. That's why we need also to check, to test the requirements. Normally, as they hear, testing is intended to show that a program does what it is intended to do and to discover program defects before it is put into use. What you have mentioned uh, generally is this part to discover program defects mm, with the code, but we need also pay attention to the requirements. A program should do what it, it is intended to do. And when we test the software, we execute a program using artificial data. And we check the results of the test run for errors. Um, um, anomalies or, chance, or information about the program's non-functional attributes can reveal the, the presence of errors, not their absence. Yeah, this is uh, what is uh, said by, I think, Dixture, with who is an early contributor to the development of software engineering. Um, he said, testing can only show the presence of errors, not their absence. That means when we test, if we find some errors, we know it exists. But if we don't find any errors, we cannot guarantee there is no errors. We can just say, for the moment, we haven't seen any error. Testing is part of a more general verification and validation process, which also includes static validation techniques. Mm, yeah. I said here, testing is a, it's a part of a broader process of software verification and validation. Here, validation and verification they are not the same thing, although they are often confused, but they are not the same. We have two, yeah, here we have summarized the two distinct goals of the testing process. The first one, is to demonstrate to the developer and the customer that the software meets its requirements. 
For customer software, this means that there should be at least one test for every requirement in the requirements document. For generic software products, it means that there should be tests for all of the system features plus combinations of these features that will be incorporated in the product release. So you see the first the first goal, the first objective is to is to guarantee that our system corresponds to what the customer need. And the second one is to discover situations in which the behavior of the software is incorrect, undesirable, and does not conform to its specification. Defect testing is concerned with rooting out undesirable system behavior, such as system crashes, unwanted interactions with other systems, incorrect computations and data corruption. So you see there are a sequence consequence and some serious consequences of software defects. We need to pay attention to the um, to these defects just as what you said with the code. Yeah, what we have seen here, these two objectives. The first objective leads to validation tests. Validation testing. Here, we expect the system to perform correctly using a given set of test cases that reflect the system's expected use. And the second objective leads to defect testing. Here, the test cases are designed to expose defects. The test cases in defect testing can be deliberately obscure and need not reflect how the system is normally used. Of course, there is no definite boundary between these two approaches to testing. During the validation testing, we will find, um, yeah, during this validation testing, we are to demonstrate to the developer and the system customer that the software meets its requirements and a su successful test shows that the system operates as an intended. For the defecting, testing it is to discover faults or defects in the software where its behavior is incorrect or not in conformance with its specification and a successful test is a test that makes the system perform incorrectly and so exposes a defect in a system so you see there is no definite boundary between these two approaches to testing during this validation testing, we will find defects in the system. And during the defect testing, some of the tests will show that the program meets its requirements. So they are interleaved. You see here we have a diagram. This diagram helps us to explain the differences between validation testing and defect testing. We need to think the system being tested. This system, we think it as a black box and the system accepts inputs from some input set one here. Input, some input set I here and generates outputs in our output set or here. Some of the outputs will be error naysays, like shown here, outputs which reveal the presence of defects. So here we have some outputs, some error nears outputs. These are the outputs 
in the set R E, and we generate this by the system in response to inputs in the in in the set I E. The priority in defect testing is to find those inputs in the set I E because these reveal problems with the system. And validation testing involves testing with the correct inputs that are outside IE. These stimulate the system to generate the expected correct outputs. You see here is for this input output model of program testing, we consider the system as a black box and we have the input test data and output test results. Uh, we have the, the outputs with the, uh, which reveal the presence of uh, defects from the inputs causing different uh, abnormal behaviors. You see here is for the a brief introduction of our eighth chapter. We have also some other information about the validation and verification. Yeah, we'll talk about it later after the break. Now I think I will note your attendance. So I have, hi, we are back. It's not normal that you have, you, you keep silence like this during the break. What are you doing? <laughs> and during the break, you, you don't chat with each other? Oh, <laughs> sorry for keep you waiting. Mm. Oh, you have, it's the homework, the assignment for other courses or? Okay, mm. so we'll continue. And later after class, you will have more time perhaps to continue with your work. Mm. Yeah, just then we have talked about this part for the difference between verification and validation. For verification, verification, we may ask the question, are we building the product right? And for the validation, oh yeah. Mm, here with this question, we want to know if the software conforms to its specification. And the validation, we ask the question, are we building the right product? The software should do what the user really require, requires. In fact, yeah, these verification and validation processes, they are concerned with checking that software being developed meets its specification and its requirements. and delivers the functionality expected by the people paying for the software. 
So these checking processes start as soon as the requirements become available and continue through all stages of the development process. And the aim of verification here is to check that the software meets its stated functional and non-functional requirements. For the very validation, however, it is a more general process. The aim of valid validation is to ensure that the software meets the customer's expe expectations. And it goes beyond simply checking conformance with the specification to demonstrating that the software does what the, re the customer expects it to do. And validation, it is essential because as we have discussed before, perhaps in the fourth or in the fifth chapter, requirements specification do not always reflect the real wishes or needs of system customers and the users. So we need to perhaps validate multiple times to do, um, to exactly satisfy what the user really requires. And um, the ultimate aim of validation and the verification is to establish confidence that the software system is fit for purpose. You see here is the verification and the validation conf confidence. With this one, it means that the system must be good enough for its intended use. And yeah, depends on system's purpose, user expectations and the marketing environment. We can, yeah, we can decide the level of required confidence depends on these three parts, system's purpose, the expectations of the system users and the current marketing environment. The first level is the software purpose. The more, um, yeah, the more critical the software, the more important that is reliable. For example, the level of confidence required for software used to control a safety critical system is much higher than that required for a prototype that has been developed to demonstrate new product ideas. The second level is the user expectations. Because of their experiences with a buggy, unreliable software, many users have low expectations of software quality. They are not surprised when their software fails. And when a new system is installed, users may tolerate failures because the benefits of use outweigh the cost of failure recovery. And in these situations, we may not need to de devote as much time to testing the software. However, as software matures, users expect it to become more reliable. So more thorough testing of later versions may be required. The third level is the marketing environment. This one. When our system is marketed, the sellers of the system must take into account competing products. The price that customers are willing to pay for a system and the required schedule for delivering that system. In a competitive environment, a software company may decide to release a program before it has been fully tested and debugged. 
because they want to be the first into the market. If a software product is very cheap, users may be willing to for tolerate a lower level of reliability. So you see here we have three levels of required confidence, software purpose, user expectations, and a marketing environment. Here, this figure shows the software inspections and testing support. They support the verification and validation at different stages in the software process. The errors here indicate the stage in the process where the techniques may be used. You see, as well as the software testing, the verification and the and validation process may involve software inspections and the reviews. Inspections and reviews analyze and check the system requirements. Design models and the program source code and even propose the system tests. These are so-called static verification and validation techniques in which we don't need to execute the software to verify it. And here we see the inspection and testing. They support the verification and validation at different stages like system prototype, program, also requirements specification, software architecture, UML design models, database schemas, they support these different stages in the software process. And with these errors, we know the stages in the process where the techniques may be used. Yeah. Software inspections Mostly, they focus on the source code of a system, but any readable representation of the software, such as its requirements or a design model, can, yeah, we can inspect all these different parts. And when we inspect a system, we use knowledge of the system, its application domain and the programming or modeling language to discover errors. Yeah, you see here for the software inspection, they are concerned with analysis of the static system re representation to discover problems. So we call it static verification. And it may be supplemented by tour based document and code analysis. For software testing, they are concerned with exercising and observing product behavior. These are some dynamic verification. And we have the system which is executed with test data and its operational behavior is observed. For the inspections, as I said before, um, they involve people exam examining the source representation with the aim of discovery, uh, anomalies and defects. We don't require execution of our system, so inspections may be used before implementation, and they may be applied to any representation of the system. We have the requirements, design configuration data, test data, etc. And these inspections have been shown to be an effective technique for discovering program errors. We have some advantages of software inspection over testing. Particularly, we focus on three advantages. The first one is during testing, errors can mask or hide other errors. 
what are oh yeah uh, because inspections these are as we said before it is our static process we don't have to, we don't have to be concerned with in interactions with errors in fact what are neither leads to unexpected outputs we can never be sure if later outputs anomalies are due to a new error or are side effects of the original error. As we know, with inspection is a static process, so we don't have to be concerned with interactions with errors. Consequently, a single inspection session can discover many errors in our system. This is the first advantage of inspection. The second one is the incompleteness versions of our system. For this one, the incomplete versions of a system can be inspected without additional cords. If a program is incomplete, then we need to develop specialized test hardness to test the parts that are available. This obviously adds to the system development costs. And the third advantage of inspection says that as well as searching for program defects, an inspection can also consider broader quality attributes of a program, such as compliance with standards, portability and maintainability. So we can look for inefficiencies, inappropriate algorithms and a poor programming style that could make the system difficult to maintain and update. These are the advantages of inspections. Inspections and testing are, compl uh, are complementary and not opposing verification techniques. Both inspections and uh, testing should be used during the verification and validation process. The inspections can check conformance with a specification but not conformance with the customer's real requirements. Inspections cannot check unfunctional characteristics such as performance, usability, etc. So you see, uh, inspections cannot replace software testing and inspections are not good for discovering defects that arise because of unexpected interactions between different parts of a program, timing problems or problems with the system performance. Furthermore, especially in small companies or development groups, it can be difficult and expensive to put together a separate inspection team as all potential members of the team may also be software developers. This one, this figure, is an abstract model of the traditional testing process. And usually we use this model of software testing process in our plan-driven development. We see that test cases, there are specifications of the input inputs to the test and the expected outputs output from the system, the test result, plus a statement of what is being tested. Test data are the inputs that have been devised to test a system. Test data can sometimes be generated automatically, but automatically case Automatic case, test case generation is impossible. 
as people who understand what the system is supposed to do must be involved to specify the expected test result. However, test execution can be autom automated. The expected result results are automatically compared with the predicted results so there is no need for a person to look for errors and anomalies in the test run now we get the test reports here so typically a commercial software system has to go through three stages of testing these are the first yeah this is the first stage which is the development testing here where the system is tested during development to discover bugs and defects system designers and programmers are likely to be involved in the testing process. And the second stage of testing is the release testing, where a separate testing team tests a complete version of the system before it is released to users. And the aim of this stage, this release testing stage, is to check that the system meets the requirements of system stakeholders. The third advanced stage of testing is the user testing, where users or potential users of a system test the system in their own environment. As we say that the development is open host target type we may have different systems of development and the use the and the final yeah end users here for software products the user may be an internal marketing group who decide if the software can be marketed released and sold so acceptance testing is one type of user testing where the customer formally tests a system to decide if it should be accepted from the system supplier or if further development is required. So you see, in practice, the testing process usually involves a mixture of manual and automated testing. In manual testing, a tester runs the program with some test data and compares the results to their expectations. They note and report discrepancies to the program developers. And in automated testing, the tests are encoded in a program that is run each time the system under development is to be tested. And this is usually faster than manual testing especially when it involves regression testing, rerunning previous tests to check that changes to the program have not introduced new bugs. And the use of automated testing has increased considerably over the past few years. However, testing can never be completely automated as automated tests can only check that a program does what it is supposed to do. It is practically impossible to use automated testing to test systems that depend on how things look, like graphical user interface, or to test that a program does not have unwanted side effects. Mm, yeah, so you see, the testing process is uh, important and is complicated, mm -hmm. complex at some times. Yeah, now we will see different stages of testing. 
The first one, development testing will see it in detail. Mm. Yeah, if you, I'm not sure if you, if you, if perhaps we may have our, have our summary um, before continuing, else you are, you, you will have too much things in one time. What we need to know here. Yeah. Mm. At first, we have to keep in mind Mm. Yeah, the two important or distinct goals, objectives of the testing process, as what we have mentioned at the beginning of this chapter. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't seen your yeah, debugging is the hardest part. Yeah, and when you finally find the bug, sometimes you may feel very stupid. <laughs> it's, I think it's the conclusion of your experience. Yeah, after programming for, for a moment, you, yeah. But uh, what you say, after, uh, after finding the bug, we may find it, very, uh, the bug is very easy to solve, but if we, if we are in the process of finding the bug, we may find it too difficult because there are so many things that we cannot find it. Yeah. And here we have to make sure about the two distinct distinct objectives objectives of the testing process Do you remember the two distinct objectives of the testing process? Um, yeah, we we may have different expressions for this um, for this question. We can have different answers, but yeah, the essential is to get the principle. Like what you have said at the beginning of the class, you have talked about some some aspects to test during this stage. User experience and bug testing. Mm, yeah, something like this. Uh, yeah, we have said that two objectives, if we experience them, if we describe them with a long face, long, long sentences, mm, we may say first objective is to, uh oh, I'm sorry, is to demonstrate. 
uh, first objective is to demonstrate to the developer and the customer that the software meets its requirements. Here is the first objective. And the second one is to discover situations in which the behavior of the software is incorrect, undesirable, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, or that not confirm to its specification. Specification. Spacey specification. Yeah, these are two objectives. We can also um to be how to say. To be concept, um, to be more general, we can say uh, the first objective is the validation. It's the validation testing. where we expect the system to perform correctly using a given test, a given set of test case that reflect the system's if, uh, expected use. Yeah, you can have the um, validation testing to see if the system to see if the system perform correctly using a given, yeah, like what you say, uh, yeah, uh, validation and uh, defect testing. Yeah, Kaya, you are right. Validation testing to see if the system perform correctly using a given set or for test cases that reflect the system's expected use. You see this one, this validation testing, it corresponds to the first objective too, to demonstrate the developer and the customer that the software meets its requirement. The same thing that reflect the system's expected use. And the second objective is, uh, like said by Kaya, um, defecting, defect testing to see uh, defecting, defect testing where the test. cases are designed to expose defects. Yeah, you see the first one is about the requirements and the second one is to discover the abnormal situations with the code, with the system. These are two distinct objectives of the testing process. And later, we have talked about um, three levels, three levels of required confidence.
Yeah, and um, to determine these levels, we need to know the system's pur purpose, the expectations of the system users and the current marketing environment for the system. Software purpose, user expectations. Yeah, very good, Kaya. And the third one, marketing environment, perfect. Yeah, thank you very much, Kaya, for these three levels of required confidence. And we have talked about the three advantages of uh, software inspection over testing. We have said during the test, during testing, errors can hide or mask other errors. Incomplete versions of our system can be inspected without additional cords, and as well as searching for program defect, an inspection can also consider broader quality attributes of a program. Mm. Yeah. Okay, the last question is about the three stages of testing. Three states of testing. Especially a commercial software system has to go through. A commercial uh, software system has to go through three stages of testing. Which three? Mm, inspection. Inspection is one stage. I'm sorry. Other propositions. Mm, okay. Perhaps this part is not very clear till the moment. We have talked about three stages. The first one is the development testing. Development testing. In fact, it's just behind. It is these three stages of testing. But I have, yeah, exactly. Development testing. I have uh, hide, they, hide them here. Um, not test J given. It's the release. Yeah, exactly. I said by Ramnak, release testing. And the third one is the user testing. For the development testing, we test the model during development to discover bugs and defects as what we, um, I think in the daily life, the most, of, uh, the most of time we talk about this development testing. As our system designers and programmers, we are likely to be involved in this stage, the testing process, yeah. So the first stage is the development testing and the second one is the release testing where a separate testing team tests a complete version of the system before it is released to users so here we are consider the 
system as a whole, and that means we all test the complete version of the system before releasing to users. And often this work is done by a separate testing team, a professional testing team. And the objective of this stage is to check that the system meets the requirements of the system stakeholders, the end users. And the third one is the user testing. Here, instead of a separating testing team, we'll ask some users or potential users of the system, yeah, of our system to test the system in their own environment. It's like the last stage of the delivery. We will directly test the system in the final environment. And for software products, the user may be an internal marketing group who decide if the software can be marketed, released, and sold. So you see here, acceptance testing is one type of user testing where the customer formally tests a system to decide if it should be accepted from the system supplier or if further development is required. So you see this third stage, user testing is a, a, determinant, a determinant one too. Here you see these three stages, development testing, release testing, and user testing. For development testing, the system is tested during development to discover bugs and defects. For release testing, a separate testing team tests a complete version of the system before it is released to users. And user testing, where users or potential users of a system test the system in their own environment. You see, it's a gradual process. The first one, it is tested by, our, by us system designers or programmers directly. The second one, we'll ask others, a separate testing team to test the complete version of the system. And the third one, the third stage, we ask the final users, the end users, the potential users of the system to test the system. Also, we will test the system in the final environment. So you see, we have a gradual relationship between these three stages, these three stages of testing. Yeah. Um, in the next class, we will begin to introduce these three stages in detail: the development testing, release testing, and the user testing. For the moment, do you have some questions? Some questions for this part? No? Okay. I find that someone is missing. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Um, it's at the, the beginning of the class, we have three absence. Yeah, we have Ken, uh, Kamru, Zama, and uh, I mean, three actions for today. Okay. If you don't have some questions, we will stop here. Um, yeah. We will see. Yeah, we will continue tomorrow with the three states in detail. And we don't have assignment today, but tomorrow we will have some. Okay. So see you tomorrow. Bye-bye, have a good time. Bye-bye.